Hello, and welcome to the Dharma Junkie Podcast. I hope that this moment finds you well. Right now, you have nowhere to go, nothing to do, no one to be, and nothing to fix. Just simply arrive into this present moment. So this is another one of those episodes that got recorded a while back, actually on April 30th of this year, and just never made its way to release. But here we are. And on this episode, my guest is Cal Melkes. Cal is an astral projection coach and just a really great guy. We had an awesome conversation. But in putting this episode together, I noticed that his webpage, calmelkes.com, is no longer active. But his YouTube page is still up, but that also hasn't been updated in a few months. So all I can really say is that, Cal, I hope that you're okay and that I really enjoyed our conversation. And I know that everyone listening, you're going to enjoy it too. So with that being said, without any further ado, Cal Melkes. You might catch yourself sliding in and out of you might catch yourself sliding in and out of a hallucinatory state. Do, just relax and enjoy it. Do, just relax and enjoy it. This is an experiment, this is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, and your mind and your brain. Using digital, using techniques, digital techniques to overload, to overload and scramble, and scramble, confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, chaos is beautiful. Is beautiful. Hey, man, welcome to the, the, the Dharma Junkie Podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, man, it is a, a pleasure to have you on. Uh, we were speaking before I started recording, and it seems we have a bit in common. Could you, uh, could you give people maybe a little bit of background about yourself? Of course, of course, of course. So uh, my name is Cal Moquez. I am an astro projection coach. Uh, I teach meditation, transcendental meditation, holotropic breathing, uh, I do hypnotherapy as well. And what I what I pride myself on, the bulk of my work is taking people from a place where they've never had an astral projection or out of body experience and getting them to a place where they are having those experiences for the first time. And I help people through the fear and the anxiety that they may have. And a lot of times it's a lack of confidence that people have in their own abilities. Uh, you know, we've gone through this you know, this way of living where we think they're the psychics in this camp and then they're the normal people and they don't intermingle. You know, you're either born this or you're born that. And in the realm of spirituality, that's kind of flawed. That's a, it's an incorrect way of looking at things. I think everyone has this innate ability to um, move their conscious awareness, to tap into their psychic abilities and so on and so forth. So I teach people the fundamentals of that and through hypnosis, I guide them through these experiences so that they can have their first experience or open the door for them to have their first experience. Um, I got my start a long time ago. I've been doing this for at least teaching people for about a decade now. Um, and I got my start pretty normally. I wasn't like a, a superhero growing up. I didn't uh, fly down from Krypton or you know, touch a magic meteorite or anything like that. I was a normal kid. I just had this this distinct knowingness that uh, I had done this life thing before. And that was the thing that stuck with me all the time was I've done this before. I've lived life before. Birthdays, trips, you know, activities. I think to myself, you know, I can't really be too happy about this because I've done it already a few times. You know, this isn't my family. This isn't my life. I'm just here for some reason. I just don't know what. And so as a kid, I was I was an adventurer. You know, I was a seeker of these answers. And eventually I met the right people, my mentor being one of them, uh, who had a lot of these interesting abilities, who could, you know, he could perceive people's thoughts and, you know, he could see visions and, you know, astral project and all these other cool things. He saw spirits and stuff. And so, like, it introduced me to this whole realm of spirituality in a more realistic way. Right on. So how did you, how did you come in contact with your mentor? And like, at first, I got to have you. 
you guys made it was up. Great. It was a great time. Great time. I, I was I was looking for someone like that for so long. I I'd, I'd found people here and there as I was growing up. People who were like, you know, they had a signpost like, yeah, this is the direction you want to move in. And I'd be like, hmm, you know, that's interesting. Right. I eventually got into hypnosis uh, on my own because I knew at a certain point that in my mind, in the subconscious mind, was the seat of all human ability like it's just locked in this subconscious mind and we just have to find a way to get there yeah. and so i used hypnosis to do that and so with hypnosis i taught myself how to relax i taught myself how to get to these places of trance and later on that moved me to meditation um meditation later on to lucid dreaming but i had a knack for kind of dipping into those spiritual things that people would deem were a little out there you know, I I entertained whatever spirit was there that could help me along the journey. And I didn't care for whether it was good or bad. I was just trying to do it. You know, I was just I was in it regardless. I was there and meeting my mentor was a product of becoming a Christian, trying to dive into that system of spirituality. Mm. And I, I actually met him because he came from a different church somewhere um, to the church that I was going to. And his reasoning was. As crazy as it sounds all the time when I say it, he's like, God told me to go from that church to this church because there was someone there that I needed to mentor. Sure. I was like, oh, sweet. I then proceeded to have three consecutive dreams night after night about him teaching me things. The last dream being him teaching me uh, or or him telling me like, hey, we need to set up meetings and have this mentorship thing go on, this and this and that. Right. And I, I messaged him on Facebook and I'm like, hey, man, it's going to sound weird. But, you know, I've been dreaming about you, <laughs> you know, and I described the dreams and he's like, oh, you know, that's uh, I've been waiting for someone to come with that sort of information. And I had a feeling it was you. I was just waiting for confirmation. And so that's how we kind of got mixed up with each other. It was very strange. Right. On. And when was that? Oh, this was way back. This is like uh, 2011, 2012, okay. you know, a uh, long time ago. So that, would you say that that was kind of the beginning of your your spiritual journey? Was well, I, I mean, I assume it was when you started going to church in the first place, right? Sure, yeah, where I cultivated it myself, yeah, right. right. But would you say that that's when it kind of started to really open up for you? Was when you started working with with your mentor? Yeah, yeah, definitely. When, when I met him, and he started, what he did was he brung a wealth of experience and these these stories of encouragement of his own experiences. You know, it's like, oh, I did this. I did that. This is possible. This is real. Yada, yada. And he didn't have an agenda behind it. It wasn't like he was trying to sell me anything or, you know, get me to go to some retreat somewhere. He was just like, hey, man, I'm a real person and I experience this stuff. So what you're looking for is real. And, you know, that kind of started it off. Right. On. And so so what, what did you like? What was the focus when you started with working with him? Was it was it like astral projection or like which what way did how did he open up the door for spirituality for you in a more extensive way? Hmm. Well, when we started, it was mostly his unique abilities. Like one of the main ones was his ability to, to read people's minds. And I say this and people are just like, you're absolutely insane. Like, well, you can think that that's fine. <laughs> but <laughs> You know, I don't mind that. Right. It's because when you, when you have something authentic and people are like, you're crazy. It's like, okay, that's, I'm just trying to show you, you know, whatever. Uh, but <laughs> he he had these interesting skills and abilities that uh, I was I, I got really engrossed in. And so I started to practice what he did. And one of the main things was energy and how to feel your energy and how to move your energy around and, right. uh, you know, meditation and quieting the mind and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, my primary goal was to connect with God the way he could. And that was the most interesting thing, because he would he would have these trips and experiences that seemed as though they were initiated by an outside force. Right. You know, I don't call myself a Christian now, I, but I take a lot of what he taught me about connecting with spirits into my practice of magic and everything else. Right. On. That, that's pretty awesome, man. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of curious about transcendental meditation. I mm -hmm. I have a very dedicated meditation practice, but I don't really delve into TM. I'm more like in the insight meditation camp, you mm -hmm. know, concentration meditation, jhana meditation, stuff like that. But 
Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about TM. Could we talk about that for a little bit? Could you like, tell me uh, what, what exactly is transcendental meditation and how can someone like reach these states of, uh, trance, I guess, mm. for lack of sure. a better <laughs> So, uh, transcendental meditation, you'll find many different, uh, definitions of the TM. There are people who like trademarked it and oh, they yeah, have their yeah. own technique and all yeah, that other stuff. David Lynch is all over the internet with that shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like they, they've got their own like trademark thing. And at the end of the day, it's just another meditation technique. Okay. Uh, transcendental meditation to me is the practice of trying to reach a higher plane or a higher level of consciousness okay. and have that higher level of consciousness be your natural state as you move through it. Because you're trying to transcend this normal reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can do that through various meditations. One of the simplest ones is observing breath, you know, and coupling that with your intention. Astral projection for me is a means of doing that, where you're transcending what's known, what you experience naturally through the use of meditation. And so, like I said, there are those trademarked things, the TM, you know, funny enough, right. uh, that that people, they teach a specific line of things. It's all a similar technique. Meditation at its core right. is just realizing that the present moment is the completion of everything. Like you're right here. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. This is what's happening. Man. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Present time experience. Yeah. Yeah. Non-judgmental awareness of the present time experience. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, you said you you said you're like into the like occult and like you said you do magic. I do. Yes. Yes. I do. So when did you get into that? Oh man, it's like I've kind of I've always been into it, um, but it's it's almost like a say. Imagine you're on a beach yeah. and you're just walking into the water. Yeah. You know, when you're the water is ankle deep and you're walking in, like. That's like your initial experience. It's a gradient. You're technically in it already, but you're not as deep in it as when you're, you know, it's, it's lapping over your head and so on. Yeah, yeah. So I've always been into it. Um, and w- with this mentor that I met, uh, I was into it then. Like I said, I was trying these techniques to, you know, facilitate these certain experiences. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had gone through a lot of those, opening the third eye and, you know, tapping into inner abilities and, you know, doing things like that. So I was always into it. Magic for me is learning to manipulate reality uh, through different sort of means, you know, uh, whatever means you can do it through. Manifestation to me is magic. Uh, What I practice now falls more along the lines of an Arabic uh, origin for magic, what you'd find in the Middle East, uh, Iran, uh, Lebanon, Egypt, that that sort of like that area of the world. uh, You'd get these sort of magic practices. And what I learned about magic was that it's it's basically activated or used through the through the use of names. So when you're when you're working with spells, you have certain names, for instance, uh, your mentor. I have a different one now who lives uh, in Lebanon and he's teaching me all this stuff. Um what what your mentor will give you is names, okay? And you have to have a certain level of skill before getting to this place. Okay. You'd be a good candidate for it because you've got a rigid meditation routine and you know your inner makeup, your your energy system, and you can feel and you can be still in the moment. All those things are required. But you'll receive, say, five to ten specific names, uh, these these Arabic names or these Latin names, and you'll repeat these names 50, 100 times, uh, doing a certain thing, uh, you know, wearing a certain medallion, and it will draw or uh, evoke that spirit to you. Uh, and what will happen from there is whatever you ask the spirit to do, it will do depending on what it does. You're calling an entity's name to gain its abilities. I don't, I'm not trying to make it too confusing, but that's the premise. That's the idea behind this sort of magic. Okay. And honestly, I haven't experienced anything like it before this because it, it's so potent. You call something and things get knocked over in the room and, you know, you start working with things and the result happens, you know, so it's very interesting working with spirits. This sort of magic isn't like Harry Potter. You say, you know, you're Flopendo or you're Avada Kedavra, you know, and then you shoot this lightning from a wand, you know, right. you're calling spirits to do work for you. And so it's like a dominion over spirits. And that's what you see in religious context. You have to know the name in order to work with it. 
That's fascinating. Yeah. Gee, it's yeah, that's, cool stuff. yeah, that's super interesting. So when did you start working with this new mentor and how long have you been applying the practices that he's been teaching? Not as long as the one from before. I, I met this new mentor, I think. Oh, it had to have been August of uh, 21, 2021. And I met this person just from the YouTube channel I have. You know, he's he was searching for trance and my video for trance is the highest. If you type in how to induce a trance or how to get into the trance state or something like that, my video is number one on YouTube. Oh, wow. And he's like, oh, let me see this guy. Yeah, and it's just, you know, just lucked out. Uh, I guess people really like it, uh, you know, yeah. uh, he no. found that video and he was like, yeah, you know, let me get in contact with this guy. And I taught him uh, how to get into trance. I taught him astral projection and things like that. And in exchange, he was like, I'm going to teach you what we do in this part of the world. And he gave me these spells and, you know, he told me about these experiences. Again, I feel like the relationship between a mentor, whether it's business or spirituality that you're in, a mentor should have a wealth of experience and stories to share with you because that's what encourages you. A mentor can say, hey, don't do this and don't do that, but do this. But when you have a story to go off of, oh yeah, then you see the whole experience like, oh, this is what he did. You can break it apart. You know, it's it's much more life giving, I want to say. Yeah. You know, you know, stories are just so relatable because, you know, everybody's mm-hmm. had similar experiences. So, you know, you can tell someone something, just, you know, mm-hmm. like give them the facts of the, you know, like the information. But I think if you, as you're saying, if you convey it in a story, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, I get it now. Like it just, it just, it just helps it translate a little better in my opinion. Yeah. Cause then it's not just like step-by-step rules. It's like, yo, this happened in my life. It's a real thing. And this is how you do it. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I give a lot of, I tell a lot of stories just, just for that reason. It's like, you know, especially with like meditation and, and the Dharma, it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, this is how it has impacted my life in these ways. And I think that that translates a lot better than just here is this, you know, here's this sutta, here's this, here's this, here's this, you know, it's like, oh, well, this is how it has shown up in my life. And mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I think that's a lot more powerful than just just the the basic facts you know it's like because you can look at stuff on paper and be like okay well i get it i think but then when you hear it translated into a story you're like oh all right all right so it does work that's amazing great yeah it's like so it actually has happened to people yeah that's the main thing right with enlightenment as well it's like it's happened to people before people have had these experiences what do you uh, what would you define as enlightenment now i've got a very weird view on enlightenment i think enlightenment is the far ends of the spectrum of what people think it is and it's everything in between it has to be in my opinion now if you were to sit and be present in the moment not letting fear of the future regret of the past uh you know take away your conscious awareness and you were here Mm. that's enlightenment to me because it's in that present moment that you feel the unconditional love of the universe you feel connected to everything right and that's very simple you can look at a blade of grass and be there in the present moment and see, oh, this is me. I am this experience. I'm not just looking from behind these eyes. I am the object being observed. And, and that happens in the present moment. And then there's also these crazy out there, I was in space talking to God, seeing a review of my life sort of experiences. They, they all happen. But the interesting thing is there's a certain life that has to be cultivated to make those things happen. You see, if... People who've never practiced meditation can have spontaneous experiences of enlightenment, just walking down the street, like bang, like, oh my God, I'm connected to everything. And there's this, I love everything. And every, you know, (laughs) if they can have these random experiences, not doing anything, then it's not the practice or the technique. It's, it's something more of a lifestyle that you can adapt to make this more conducive to happen. And like a lot of people will say, it is a happening to you. There is, there has to be a certain amount of grace. It just happens. Uh, But I feel like you can position your life on the tracks of this enlightenment thing and the train of enlightenment will hit you. Uh, You just have to be in the right place. I can't I can't give you a technique that would facilitate it because that would take away from it. You see, because the technique instills this idea that you don't have it already. Right. Yeah. In the book, The Cure for Enlightenment, my goal is to let people know. You don't have to go to the mountains in the Himalayas. You don't have to sit with a guru for 25 years or meditate all your life for this. You are enlightenment. 
Like you are already awakened. You right. just go on this adventure because you think you aren't. Yeah. 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 Then I think our, our views on that align, uh, pretty directly because I, that, yeah, that's exactly the way I view it. It's like, yeah, enlightenment, liberation, awakening. It's all just being in that present moment, really. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, there's nothing to attain. Mm-hmm. It's already here. Yeah. Yeah. Samsara and Nibbana are not mutually exclusive. It's all going, it's all happening right now, right here. It's like, we're, it's like you were born awake and we fall asleep into the trance of daily life. Mm. Very beautifully put. And it's true, man. It's, it's so true. We, our society, especially in the West, our society teaches us that you aren't intrinsically anything and you have to obtain. And so it reinforces this through music, through media, uh, through just life and how our society goes that you have to go <laughs> and attain before you become something. Oh, man. And so this is like having you know, a conversation with myself. <laughs> you Dude. are. We're up to say. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. But I mean, it's like, this is exactly what I've been trying to expound to people for a while now is like, and you were born completely whole and in, in Western culture and American society, especially you're taught from birth that you're missing something and you have to go out and attain it. You have to seek it. You have to go work jobs. You fucking hate doing shit. You don't want to do to try to buy shit. You don't need to try to fill the void that you think exists, but you never fill the void. That's the funny thing. That's because there's you no void. never fill the void because there is no void. Right. It's a and so lie. It's a everything you're trying to get is to fill this void in you. It's like, oh, I feel this void in me. Oh, I'm unhappy. All the biggest gurus in the world, especially sad guru, you'd be like, there's nothing wrong with you. It's in your mind. Like you think there's something wrong. If you were to change your thinking about it, then you would see, oh, I have everything already. Like I'm here already. Everything we do is to get us to a place. Uh, I got, I have this saying where I say, you are the destination. Because when you get to the top of the mountain, you think to yourself, this is it. Huh. I expected I'd be different. I'd expected it'd feel different. <laughs> you had the tools. The tools you use to get to the top of the mountain are the ones you started with. You just learned how to use them as you went up to the mountain. You know, so the, you are the destination. The goal at the end is just realizing it's you. That's why the journey is so important. You know, the destination is you, you, you know. Yeah, we are we are all just wealths of untapped human potential, really. You just have to get, get to that point. Yeah, man. Yeah. We're sleeping giants. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure, man. And so many people are asleep to that, you know, just asleep mm-hmm. to the fact that it's like, no, nah, you're you're you are okay. Like it's your it's your thinking, it's the the narratives that you've created, it's your it's the experiential conditioning of your life that has taught you that you're not this spiritual being. And that you're not completely whole and that you're not a part of God yourself. You know, I mean, they've been, you know, they've been saying this shit in the East forever. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow, somehow people just, uh, I don't know, just, just sleep on that information. It's like, ah, I don't know, man. It's been around for a long time. Maybe, maybe they were onto stuff that I think it, it wouldn't have been around quite so long if it didn't have a high efficacy rate. <laughs> right. It's, it's gotta, it's gotta be able to handle problems. Uh, it's gotta be pragmatic, basically. Like it, it must mean something. This stuff. And, and I feel like just being in the present moment is the start of it. Now, I've had crazy, wild end of the spectrum, seeing things, hearing things because I was in that present moment. Like I said, the present moment is like positioning yourself on the track. And then enlightenment comes. These experiences come. Searching for those experiences in a way is pushing them away. I've heard uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about it. He's like trying to get at this thing of who you are by doing a technique. Interesting enough that he'd be talking about it. It's like having a quarter in your pocket and you're trying to reach down in your pocket to get it. Every time you reach down in your pocket, you knock the penny or the quarter further into your pocket. You can't reach it. So it's you already have it, though, you see. And so the further you try to go, the more you try to do techniques and, and facilitate all of these things to happen. You're just reinforcing the idea that you are not what you're after. And that's the big problem. It's, it's almost like manifesting this want. People say, I, I want this. I want that. I, I want to have this. I want to have that. You're manifesting a reality of want. And that's what you'll get. You'll get to want all those things. But the moment you say, I have everything in this moment that I desire, 
Right. That's when you can experience it. And that energy you give off, that vibration you have will draw those things to you because the opposite is pushing them away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of like, um, like I would say journaling and, uh, you know, I would do like a gratitude list and then like a intentions and, you know, I write you know, stuff down every morning and, that that's one thing I've learned is like never I never write down I will blah blah blah. It's like I am the you know it's like I I already am these things. I already have this mm. whatever I whatever I I'm trying to manifest is already here. It's just I how do I wipe the lens off to see clearly, right? How do I get mm. to that place of clear discernment? Yeah. You know, in in the book, one of the main things that I point out is that when you're in this place of setting intentions and being grateful and you you want to manifest a life because we all want to live at, at our highest octave with full potential. We want to get the most out of life, of course. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. Uh, there's a thing that has to happen. And the gratefulness is a great part. It, and I feel like it's half to the whole thing. Of course, you have to know the goal. You have to know what you want because a ship never gets to its destination without first having one. Right. So you need to know what you want in life. And that even takes time. Absolutely. But once you have the gratitude for where you are and what you have in this moment is being thankful. Yes, I'm having a human experience. And in my mind, I could see it as negative. But there is beauty and joy in this moment, regardless, because I choose to make it that way. Right. The other half of that is feeling that the gratitude should help you to feel these things that you're talking about. If you want a certain lifestyle, if you want to manifest these certain things and experiences and people in your life, feeling the joy of that just goes along with the gratitude. And for me, that has changed everything. Everything I've experienced in my life, the the things I've accomplished, quote unquote, everything like that right. has been the product of sitting in meditation and saying to myself, this is what I want. That is what I want. This is what I have. This is who I am. And feeling that. Like taking a moment to rest in it and feel the joy of what your life will be like in that in that space, and it makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's fucking beautiful, man, for sure. Mm. Oh God, yes, I, I, it's. I wish this was easier to explain to people, but people push back so hard when you try to tell them shit like this, you know, mm. like your average oh, yeah. everyday. Yeah, it's. And, and for good reason. Yeah. yeah. They've got the whole world fighting against them. You know, they've, hey, especially yeah. us in the West, they, they pick it up easier. I feel like in other parts of the world, but over here, if you're not doing something to make you money and climb a corporate ladder, you're doing something wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're somehow yeah. less, you're, you're viewed as less than. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like when you, once you start to view your situation, whatever it may be, you know, like, however, however your perspective of that situation is because it's all really perspective. It's like, but once you, once you acknowledge that, yeah, in this moment, you know, things are, things are perfect just the way they are. I think that's, yeah, that's when things really start to open up. You know, that's what happened. That's the way it worked for me. It's like, once I got to a place where I was like, you know what, things are, things are fine. Like <laughs> everything's mm. just fine. Like it, that, you know, that's when, that's when shit really started happening for me. No. And it's hard to even even get to that place of just being like everything. It's fine as it is right here, accepting the present moment without judgment. Just this is how it is. And I'm going to enjoy how it is. Yeah. It's so hard to get to that because wherever you are in life, our society tells you that there is another rung on the ladder above that that you need to reach before you're happy. And how many times have we seen the wealthiest people, the most famous people take their own lives because they're at the top rungs and they're like, it still ain't here. Like, still I haven't it. found it. Yeah. You know, and it's because they're looking for something external to gratify who they are internally. And it just doesn't work that way. You can't. Yep. You will never find any, any happiness in any worldly thing. You know, mm. all things of the exterior world are impermanent and subject to loss and therefore that that happiness is subject to to loss so for me like yeah you know i think it's exactly what you're saying is that happiness really does come and contentedness not even happiness so much because i don't really deal with happiness too much but just content being content in the present moment just the way it is you know right now it's like this mm. being okay with that you know i think uh, equanimity that's that's equanimity the, that's the place to be at right mm. it's a beautiful word because like you know 
you're not being tossed and blown by the the winds and the waves of life you're just you're solid through every experience and you can't do that unless you're driven by that internal value it's like this situation is how it is and it's not going to bother me and i tell people that all the time one of the main things i talk about in the book is how you see the world is it totally up to you your experience of life is totally up to you and our society tells us differently it's like no 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 your place in life is determined by everything else around you. And there is merit to that, especially like you said, you're going to school for a degree in psychology. You know the effects of environment on a developing mind and things like that. Uh, But after a certain point, as adults, you choose what, what you allow to bother you, what you allow to inspire you. If something, I mean, you could take a rock and say, well, you know, that glass half full glass half empty thing you can do it with anything right it's like you take these simple sayings and you apply them and you're like oh well maybe that does mean something maybe every challenge or disaster actually is an opportunity when you live like that then you start living the life of the motivational speakers the the people who have impressed and surprised us like one guy that comes to mind is david goggins and it's like a phenomenal story of this guy I love uh, he's so inspirational I, when it, i don't feel not, like doing not stuff mention, not to mention his fucking videos are fucking hilarious he's just a funny <laughs> right. ass dude Get he's up, just so straight right yeah. stay hard you know he's just i love it you know and i saw a video of him and he's like bench pressing something and he's like rep after rep after rep 25 30 reps of this and you see him struggling and he reaches a point where his eyes get real wide and he's getting weak and he's like you don't know me, son. And he just starts pushing the weight even more. And he says, how, who's going to lift the boats? He says, and this is like from like seals, like, uh, like the, the seals, um, uh, training that he went through where they like run with boats and with logs. Who's going to lift the boats? He like taps into this mental field where it's like, I can do it simply because I think I can do it. Yeah. And I feel like that, that in itself, is the story of spirituality. Like I can do it despite what the world tells me or what I see in the world. If I want this for myself, I can have it because I want it. Right. And and you go through what you have to, to get it. Are you, are you familiar with any, like, have you really gotten like, you know, like Buddhism or anything like that? Are you familiar mm-hmm. with the, uh, the Satipatthana Sutta, like the four foundations of mindfulness? Uh, explain it to me. Okay, I've so, heard a lot of things without names. <laughs> okay, so like the, there's the, the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, the first one is mindfulness of uh, breath and body. So, you know, mm-hmm. you, it's just the awareness of like having this breath, having this body. And then the uh, it's the exploration of this in Buddhism. It's called the six sense doors. So it's it's all five normal senses plus mind, but not mind what you really think, like not thought, because in Buddhism, uh, the way it's described is like mind precedes thought. So you you move from this place of ec- experience in the external world and the internal world. So you have you know your your five senses that experience the external world, and then the mind that experiences that creates the internal world. But so you move from the first foundation and the second foundation. The second foundation is feeling tone, which is uh this poly term vedana. But it's really, it's the hedonic tone of the experience. So it's either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And then that will color your third foundation of mindfulness, which is mindfulness of mind. But mind is kind of really a clunky translation. It's really exactly what you were talking about. It's the attitudinal lens in which we operate. So if we're operating from a place of greed, hatred, or delusion, we're going to live a life filled with fear and aversion and grasping and clinging and 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 just not operating with wisdom but if we're operating through a lens of loving kindness compassion and wisdom we're going to see the world entirely differently and that's what colors your experience because that you know like i said the the external world or the internal world gives rise to this pleasant unpleasant or neutral feeling tone which then gives rise to the attitudinal lens which then gives rise to fucking everything else like all thoughts are 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 post that so you know you filter your experience through this lens whatever your lens is and then that colors your reality Mm. yeah that's powerful Uh, hearing those concepts it's like oh i know that that makes sense because it's like you're right like 
the world brings up this opposition in you. It's like, is this good or is it bad or is it neutral? And, and the lens by which you see life uh, kind of colors the rest of that. And yeah, that that's it, it applies to everything. Like yeah. you said, it applies to everything. And I feel like these guys like David Goggins, who they, they've what he loves to say all the time is like, I, I had to build calluses on my mind. And I feel like that's what you get a lot of times with rigid meditation practice where you're meditating 30 minutes to an hour. And you're like, I'm going to stay here because I need this time to strengthen my focus and my resolve. Right. And like, you can do anything. Like yeah. if you, you change the way you see the world and your place in it. You can do absolutely anything. Yeah. 100% man. So what, what are your views? Uh, what do you, what do you feel about? What do you think about psychedelics? Like as far as, like, as being an aid in, in a spiritual path. I think it can be extremely useful. I've experimented with some psychedelics. I've had some interesting experiences. And every time it continues to reiterate this idea that we are everything. And, you know, you get to these places where like everything is connected. I can love everyone. And it's almost like they break down the boundaries that you have between you and everyone else. Because I, I tell people all the time, this is one of the things that you'll see in the book is this concept of, uh, of who we are internally. What is the ego right. going into these experiences of life? The ego is the dividing principle. It's the thing that says, this is me and that's not me. Right. And when you can quiet the ego, that's when you start to have these experiences where it's like, well, oh, okay, this, there's no difference between this and I. And it, one of the interesting things about spirituality that psychedelics kind of matches with is when you dive deep into spirituality or say your third eye is active or you've spent time doing that uh, and you've spent time in that space. There, there's an interesting experience when the third eye activates or you're astral projecting, you're in this, this other dimension, you're in this other world where there isn't ownership on anything. Right. There just is an experience <clears throat> and you're just aware of the experience and that there's no ownership. And so the same thing could apply to this world. Like there is no ownership. There's no boundary. Everything is what it is. You are a part of that everything. And that's one of the greatest lessons. Of course, trips can be wild and challenging and things like that. And I've dealt with a lot of challenging trips, but some of the main ones have been trips that have mixed with my mental state so much that I see, oh, okay, this reality thing is just happening in my mind. Like psychology will tell you, a neuroscience will tell you that we're all hallucinating our realities. Yeah, absolutely. Everything. Yes, we have stimuli that hit our nervous system, go to the brain, we interpret, yada, yada. But everything happens inside of us. Right. You've never had an experience external to you. It's in your head, everything that you've ever experienced. And so when you alter how that process goes in your mind, you can experience anything. And that's what these these great gurus will show us is that they'll manipulate reality at a certain place. They'll do things with their body like they're gurus who've been tested by these big universities and, and they change or alter their heart rate or, yeah. you know, they go days and days and days without food or water and they're totally fine. And, you know, things like this where it's like you can alter these things, but it starts with this process in the brain. Right. Yeah, I think that they definitely show the they, they show you the we are definitely connected to everything. Like everything is interconnected and not just people, but like all beings and all, all things are connected, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it can really, I think it, they can potentially make you a, a more loving and kind person because of that, because I think it shows you the humanity in, in everyone else. You know, it's really easy to get wrapped up in life and, and hold resentments and, you know, be angry with people. And, you know, especially like we've been saying, especially in the West, because that is cultivated where this individualistic ideal is cultivated in the West. Like it, it's me against the world. It's dog eat dog. And it's like, no, nah, man, it's not, not fucking like that. It's like, mm. we are all in this shit together. One of my, uh, one of my teachers, Claude Anshin Thomas, he's a Soto Zen monk in the, uh, he runs the Zalto foundation, which is a, like, it's a, a foundation that's dedicated to uh, spreading the message of peace. He he's a former, he's a Vietnam vet. Right. And he's, he's done some like pretty horrific shit, like blown up whole neighborhoods. And like, I mean, he's killed a lot of people. So he yeah. had been to this point of peace. Right. But he's, and he, he's, you know, he's talked to me about this and he's, I think he's even mentioned this on uh, some podcasts is that the military trains you 
to see people as less than human because you can't kill someone that you see humanity in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's tough. That's tough. Did you imagine like the, the two extremes, like what it would take for someone to go from, I'm a, I'm a dog of the military. I'm a machine. Like I execute an order regardless of how morally gray it may be. Right. And switching over to I'm all about peace and I love everything the the gap the expanse in between it's it's just so big something has to happen extreme beyond that to get you to the other side it's just, it's crazy to think about yeah. but like you said you have to see people as as less than you've got to you have to remove their humanity and I feel like that's what the military does yeah is uh, it, it takes your humanity teaches you to be just a, a robot going through these things yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what he said. You know, it's like they, they strip the humanity away from any potential enemy. And that enables you to to do harm. Because if you do see the humanity in, in people and you know, you you recognize them as a a a fellow spiritual being, you, you're not gonna be able to harm the person. So mm-hmm. they have to strip that away from you. And that's just fucking tragic, you know. It is, yeah. It's the things that need to happen to keep this world so violent and malicious. Right. Well, what if, what if we all work together <laughs> and right. made the world a better place? It, it sounds childish and naive, but like, think about it. There are people on this planet buying social media platforms for $45 billion. Does it sound childish and naive, or is that just the story that we've been told that it sounds childish and naive? Exactly. If you believe this, you're obviously a child. I feel like we have the means and the money, the opportunity to make this world a totally different place. I mean, just think about it. All the time we spend competing with each other, different nations, we could be coming together to make things just tremendously better. Right. Like, yeah, it, What's this fostered sense of, of lack and that turns into the sense of competition that fuels this individualistic lifestyle that society has created, you know, we need some aliens, man. (laughs) Sure. I used to always think that we need some aliens to come down here and be like, what are you guys talking about? You're the same people. (laughs) (laughs) You guys are fighting with each other. Like it's different species. We we're out here fighting against each other, ready to drop nuclear bombs on each other. For what difference? Well, you know, for like for me, like ego is really just the illusion of separation. That's all it ever is. We can't have an individual experience without ego because ego is the dividing principle. It's the separation that we need to be. Oh, this is me. Right. But when you drop the ego, it's like, oh, I can't blow this guy up. That's me. <clears throat> right. Like it's as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. Once you recognize that, and quite literally, everybody is just you living a different experience. It's like, mm. oh shit! Now I get it. Now I get I, it. I've talked about it before, and I think it's a fascinating concept. What if consciousness wasn't local to you? What if consciousness just wasn't in your head and yours? Right. What if? Your human body is just filtering this pervasive, all expansive consciousness of the universe you're just into a, this one experience. You're just a receptor. Exactly. Yeah. And so we've all got the same consciousness just in these different vessels. Oh, I'm different from you because I grew up different or, you know, whatever the case may be. My body has gone through different changes. I've learned different things, but we're the same people. Right. I, I, how often I get into these podcasts with people and we are the same person. Like the, the energy, the vibe is just, it's just there. It's like, Oh, I know you. Of course you do. We're the same. I'm not Cal. You're not Justin. Like we are the consciousness experiencing life through these eyes. You're the, we're just conscious awareness. Yeah. 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 Alan Watts, he puts it great. We are the aperture by which the universe perceives itself. Yeah, man, uh, that what a true fucking gem Alan Watts was, right? Like, if I've ever, right? if I've ever, had, like, I man, I was listening to Alan Watts like all night last night. Like, I, uh, I, I found this like really cool like uh Alan Watts like chill step thing on like so the oh, you know, like, like, yes. like really like cool like you know, relaxing like meditative kind of music like with Alan Watts 
obviously mm. because they love putting music to Alan Watts, but it goes really well. <laughs> Makes it dramatic. It, it does, but it, you, it, it's harder to find an Alan Watts lecture that doesn't have music to it now. Yeah, I tell you. Uh, th- there's one with music, but it's a really good one. I, I remember finding this. It had to have been like one or two in the morning. One of those like random nights where you're doing a ton of research and just looking into stuff. Right. And it's it's on YouTube. It's called Nature of God by alan watts it's got it's got millions and millions of views but it's such a good one because he's describing the the principle of like the necessity of duality and how just in the fact that there is duality it denotes that there is oneness because one can't exist without the other they must be one if you need oxygen to live if you need the sun to survive you are connected with those things you are those things Right. And so Alan Watts talks about this underlining principle, the the negative principle, and he's talking about the void of the universe and how that void creates the space for there to be things like you don't know something is outstanding unless something is in standing. You see, yeah. like, you don't you don't know that there's a substance without uh, like without uh, you don't know that the, there's something there without the substance. Right. Like there has to be something underneath. Well, it's like, it's like the Tao, you know, it's like, it's like, if I take mm. this pen, it's like, well, there's, there's this, there's this end and then there's this end, but it's not that one can't lift without the other because they both lift at the same time, because that's just the way it works. It's like, it's all, mm. it's all the same thing. It's all right? connected. This mm. and that, that and this and everything yeah. in between is all, all lifted and or raised or lowered together. You know, it's because mm. it is all the same and it, it is all connected and we, Mm-hmm. people talk about the environment and it's like which what what part like it's all the environment like everything is environmental like mm. quite it's literally just, everything like it's all happening yeah everything is happening and, and that's another thing i love about alan watts is uh his concept of it's like are you doing it or is it happening to you i love that so much he describes meditation and like just focus on the breath and you know breathe in deeply for a little bit and once once you've done that for like a minute or two, just stop and observe your breath and notice, if you will, how your breath is happening to you. Right. Like, are you doing the breathing or is it happening to you? Right. You've been breathing this whole podcast episode. Mm-hmm. You haven't been thinking about it. It's just been happening to you. Yeah. It's, it's an like, au- it's, autonomic process. Exactly. And all of reality is an autonomic process. We're, we're in a theater watching this experience behind our eyes. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's all just, it's, it's all happening. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I talk about that a lot too, man. It's like, cause you, in relation to thought, because, you know, people are like, Oh, I just can't stop my thoughts. I was like, yeah, how, how would you expect to like, you're not the author of your thoughts. Like yeah. that, that too is an autonomic process. The non-volitional thought is an autonomic process, mm. you know, volitional yeah. thought. Like we can, we can sit and we can write papers for school and we can use the volitional mind, but the, the non-volitional mind is, like, no, I'm not the author of that, you know, like those, yeah. those thoughts where you're like, oh, that's a weird thing my brain's doing. But if you it's can get so to the awesome. point where you can observe that and just go, oh, that's a silly thing my brain's doing right now. Where did, where did that even come from? Like, stop like, identifying with the thoughts. Stop identifying with them. You are not your thoughts. Yeah. You see, we're the same person. We're having the same experience here. Because <laughs> right. I, I tell people that all the time. You are not your thoughts. So many people spend their time in meditation trying to stop their thoughts. And I don't think that's (laughs) right. Like I I haven't met anyone who's got zero thoughts going through their mind. Right. It's it's a misconception. The thoughts are just another process. Like you said, the non-volitional thought, it's just another process. Sub vocalization just happens. Yeah. Don't worry about that. It's not you. What happens is people think the thoughts are them. It's like, well, A a great way to put it is if you can observe a process, you are not that process. And the way that it was described was just like a finger can't scratch itself. Right. And eyeballs can't see themselves. Like the mind can't observe itself. Right. Inside of a system, you can't control that system. You have to be outside of it. So because you can observe your thoughts, you cannot be them. Dude. We are, we are the same person. <laughs> I tell people that all the time. I'm like, I was like, anything observable is not you. Like you, oh, exactly. if you can observe it, then it's, how can it be you? You can't observe yourself. Right. <laughs> you know, like, You've got to be separate from this thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just, you know, people, yeah, they, they, they believe their thoughts are them 
and then they get wrapped up in the stories and the narratives and the beliefs that they create around those those non volitional thoughts. And it's like, don't hey, don't don't do that. <laughs> don't mm. do, you setting yourself up for failure with that one? Like they, they beat themselves up. It's like, oh, I'm thinking again. Oh, do this, all oh, that. Just observe it. You know, the easy meditation of watching your your thoughts pass by the the yeah. sky of your mind like clouds. Just yeah. let them go by, yeah. like trains in a train station. Let them go by. You get more into that observer mindset and you're pulling back from the experience. And then you realize, oh, the present moment is just an experience that I'm observing. Like, oh, I'm just here watching this whole thing. And that's when all the cool things happen because you're aware of them. Life is a cosmic play. So many times when I when I sit to be present in the moment, I'm sitting outside. Mm -hmm. There is an orchestra of activity and movement and sound going on in front of me. I'm like, I'm watching a play right now. Yeah. birds chirping and flying around right in front of me things are moving and you know the clouds are making this right for me and i'm like there's no way this is happening all over the world right now so it's like it's this moment the symphony of experience e, very excellent way to put it yeah Eric, the symphony of experience it's like yeah it's all it's all it's all going down it's all happening it's just just for you and me hmm. Because we're all the same person. <laughs> Indeed, we just got a lot of eyes that's all it is the universe yeah. just has tons of eyes yeah, yeah. I, I, I love the the old, uh, I can't remember where I heard it, but it's like somebody, you know, came to a monk and he said, I, I want, I, you know, I want to be happy. He's like, all right, well, you know, drop, I, I want from that, or I want happiness. And then just, he said, drop, I want, you know, from that, just take that away from it, drop away the want, drop away the I, what do you have left? just happiness <laughs> and you go away from that like i can't talk to this guy man let me get out of here find uh, something that works but that actually does work it does because work. like <laughs> you're not having a bad experience there is no you there's no cal or justin it's just it's just what is and being in the present moment dissolves that idea of oh i'm having this experience like it just is well there's no there, there's no one to have a bad experience and then there is no good or bad experience there's just experience there, there just is yeah colored there through just... whatever your particular lens for the moment is you, know, yep. you, you put the connotation of good or bad on an experience you know indeed probably from some historical you know uh in, i would say uh, inductive reasoning you know like well it's happened this way before so it must be like this it's like no not necessarily i mean how do you know you're you yeah exactly. your memories the past yeah if you drop that stuff who are you from one day to the next who are you what makes you you right yeah well in the, the present moment what makes you you well you know there is no uh there's no, no static cell you know because mm-hmm. we are a constantly evolving a heap of aggregates you know we are Mm. just a heap of our experiences and the things that happen and i mean cellularly we're we're changing every day all the time so there is no static self like you can you can call you know call yourself cal and i can call myself justin but there is no static justin that's for everyone else just for identifying purposes but there is no no i there is no i can't point to a concrete whatever i am other than Mm -hmm. the observer of this experience right because you'd be like well i'm this body are you really though right no i mean it's just a vessel that that's moving around the you could say this is my body it's like this body is cal well then you'd have to say the trees outside are cal because they provide the oxygen that these lungs breathe to keep living right the whole ecosystem is cal If you wanted to put it like that. So you can't say the body is you. And you're like, well, the thoughts are me. Well, the thoughts aren't you. You don't control them. You can't stop them. The mind isn't you. It'll try to control you. So you're observing all of these processes. You see? Yeah, man. (laughs) Love it. I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. So what you had mentioned aliens. Let's talk about oh, it. Oh, yeah. Uh, you said we need some aliens. We need some aliens. Man. We need some aliens to come down and slap us a few times and say, guys, stop all this nonsense. I've heard a lot of crazy conspiracy theories. I love conspiracy theories. They're interesting. Oh, they you know, Regardless of how accurate they may be, some of them are just really interesting. But, you know, with the Tic Tacs and the things that the Navy is talking about and these different captains here and there who've chased these things down and they maneuvered all around us i've heard people say that it's just 
you know, China or Russia with these like new, you know, aircrafts and things. It's like some of these videos that are out that people can find and they've been on the news talking about these things. Yeah. Uh, some of these things move in such a way and they have such technological advancement over us that if anyone else had this technology, there would be no wars. They would trample over us like ants. Their, their technology, just watching these videos, I know nothing about aircraft and how they work or the maneuverability, but just seeing what these things do and how they just disappear one second and appear the next and move all around helicopters and jets like toys. It's just like, you know, and then you, you hear stuff about like these UFOs going to missile silos and shutting them off. It's like, you know, if anybody had the power to do that on earth, <laughs> it would be a done deal. Like yep. it's over with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, maybe we do need aliens. <laughs> just maybe just to get us out of here. Especially you. if they're running around shutting down mil- missile silos. Like, let's yeah, let's get a come on, fellas, help us out here. Because <laughs> we, we are fixed. We are a fucking stupid species, but we I, have that much potential. Yeah, we do, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. How, you know, how do you tell somebody? Like, how do you convey this shit to people? You mm-hmm. know, like I don't. When every time I try to talk to a, a yeah, a normal person <laughs> they look at me like i'm <laughs> fucking crazy and i'm like all right well yeah i'm the crazy one <laughs> it's like a normal person he says you talk, yeah. you talk to someone sleeping i guess they're they're living the matrix yeah yeah exactly you know, exactly they're asleep into the there's a sleep in in the experience you know and like, like i said you know i think we're born totally awake that's why children have that that kind of wonder mm-hmm. you know like you look at like a five-year-old you know and they're just it's like they're it's like they're just immersed in spirit all the time and then we we condition that out of them. We squeeze it out of them like a rag. Just crush, like get just that out crush of it there. out of them. Just crush yeah. it out of them. Yeah. You get in that system and be a cog of the corporate life. Go in there and work for sixty five years and <laughs> and retire. Go achieve. Otherwise you're not worth shit. Oh, yeah. It's funny how in these other places, I've even heard stories of uh, people's encounter with aliens. And one of the things these aliens say is like, you don't have to do anything. Like, We're just here to experience. Like, if you know how this this society, I feel like would totally collapse if masses and masses of people adopted this idea that they have all that they need. They can live off the earth. And it's just about the experience, happiness contentment is right here right now i need nothing else it would destabilize this society immediately Uh, because this society runs on a i need this i need that i have to keep growing and keep evolving yada yada it it would just fall apart yeah i wish it would (laughs) i really do you know for a long time the stories of like economic collapse and martial law and all these crazy new world order things for a long time i was like man i can't wait i want something new this society's boring man <laughs> come on uh, right uh, okay well, cal man this has been an awesome conversation i would love to have you on again and, and kind of we can always chop it up man yeah let's do it man for sure uh, so where can people find you at you said you got a book out and a youtube mm. channel what, what else do you have going on like like tell people where they can uh, where they can get the full Cal Melquez experience. Yeah, you guys want the Cal Melquez experience? Again, I've got YouTube. You can type in my name there. You can Google my name, Cal Melquez, and you'll find a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I've got links to things like websites where people can like schedule one on ones with me for coaching and things like that. Uh, the book, The Cure for Enlightenment, is on Amazon for free. So Kindle Unlimited, you can get it for free. Oh, nice. Um, and so. If people can find me, I'm on TikTok, Cal Mokez, you know, YouTube, Instagram, nice. same name. You can find me everywhere. Sweet, man. Awesome. Well, like I said, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Uh, I know we had to reschedule the first time. but hey, uh, I'm glad we got here, though. <laughs> hey, man. It, it was bound to happen eventually. I mean, it's all happening anyway. <laughs> it's um, nothing was rescheduled. It happened right now. You know, right, so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, man. Have a great day. You as well. Thanks again to Cal Melquez for being on the show. And actually, as I've been putting this episode together, I did find a new website for Cal. So if you want to get in touch with him, I will leave links to his website and his YouTube page in the liner notes of the episode. As always, thank you for listening. This has been the Dharma Junkie Podcast. I'm Justin Otto. Namaste.